Jocelyn, long time no see. It's great to see you, especially under these wonderful circumstances. You won the Juno on this past weekend and happy birthday. A little birdie told me that it is your birthday. Is it your birthday? It is my birthday. <laughs> Thank you so much. I um, I didn't know that people knew, so that's very cool. <laughs> the internet's a fabulous place. Fun fact, <laughs> yeah. you, share, you share a birthday with another great jazz guitar player, Les Paul. No, really? Yeah. Like wow. I say, inter inter internet's a great place. <laughs> Okay. I didn't know that. That is awesome. Cool. So it's a great day for guitar. <laughs> yeah. You fall down the rabbit hole that way. Okay. So this past weekend, you won a Juno for your album, Elegant Travel. How did, I guess the obvious question is, how does it feel? Oh, it, it feels so exciting. A little bit, I mean, in the most positive way, a little bit overwhelming just because, um, everyone watches the Juno. So just from all areas of my life, from you know all stages of my life i'm hearing i'm getting messages on all the platforms and it's just pretty pretty a pretty amazing feeling yeah well i just have uh visions of your uh, email and your twitter and you know all that stuff just sort of exploding is that really is that how, what happened that's exactly what's happening and more so than you know any previous milestone i think just because the junos is something that's so widely watched and so widely followed by even people who aren't really music consumers on a daily basis. Right. And it's your first album, right? It's your first solo record. Yeah. My first album as a leader. Yeah. yeah. That's great. Okay. So you're a Winnipegger. And the first time I met you was, I don't know, I think it was eight or nine years ago. And at that time you were just wrapping up your studies at the Days Hotel Faculty of Music at the, in the jazz studies department. Can you fill us in a little bit on what you've done between then and now? Yes, absolutely. So I graduated with my undergrad in 2013, uh, went back to the U of M, did a post back in jazz performance as well. And then in 2016, moved to the United States, moved to Michigan and did my master's at Michigan State University and spent a couple years around the Detroit scene and then moved to New York, um, spent uh, a year living full time in New York and then got accepted or got won a position as the head of the guitar department at Humber College in Toronto. So then I moved to Toronto and then COVID hit and then I came back to Winnipeg. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, I didn't realize that. I thought you were still in Toronto. So you're back in, you're back in town. Huh. Yeah. Well, um, my whole family's here. So just when, when the pandemic hit, since everything is happening online anyway. I just figured I would come home. Mm -hmm. And you're, you're still, uh, you're still working at Humber and are you teaching uh, zoom lessons to your students? Is that how that's working? Yeah. We spent the entire year on zoom. So yeah. everything was online. As everybody is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so I've been listening to the record. It is unbelievable. I've listened to it several times. I've actually been having quite a bit of fun listening to it while I've been programming programming music for the station oh. there are 10 tracks on the disc seven of them are by you were these tracks written specifically for the disc elegant traveler or were these tunes that you'd been doing in clubs you want to tell us about those yeah some of them uh date back to when i was living in winnipeg um i wrote in a daydream and argyle I think those two while I was living in Winnipeg and then they just kind of the rest of them kind of span span the following years so some of them date back to even you I think 2015 um and when I sat down to program the album I just picked my favorite tunes from what I already had and then tried to fill in the gaps said you know okay I would like to write this type of tune because I need a uh, blues. So I need to write a blues. So there were a few that I wrote specifically for the record based off of what type of music I thought there needed to be in that spot. Right. Um, one of the things I really love about, about the disc is you've got horn, a great band, like amazing rhythm section and some great horn players, but it's not an album where I feel like I'm being screamed at, you know, by the, especially by the horn players, if that makes any sense. It's not like, the horn players are not higher, faster, louder. It's a very sort of intimate and very sort of chill 
uh, atmosphere for the most part of the disc, and it's uh, complemented by your uh, great guitar playing. Can you tell us about how you put the band together and maybe talk about some of the musicians that were in on the recording sessions? Yes, and absolutely. And how you met them? Yeah. Um, well, I again, it's, a, it's um, several musicians who kind of span span a few years of my life, I first and foremost look for musicians who are super swinging and who, um, you know, are going to listen to me and kind of their playing will make me sound better. And I just feel like everybody on the album does that. And the first person that I picked is the drummer, Quincy Davis, who was my former professor at the University of Manitoba. So yeah. he teaches at North Texas now. And um, I sent him a message and just said, could I please bring you to New York? We recorded in New York. Could I please, would you please do this? And he wrote me back and said, absolutely. Um, so it was very special to, to have him on it. Um, and then a few friends from my Michigan State years, a former professor, Michael D is the trombone player from Michigan State. Mm -hmm. And Anthony Stanko and George Delancey are both musicians that I know from my Michigan State years. The rest of the band, Addison Fry and Brandon Wright, are both prominent New York musicians that I met on the scene there. So it's a bit of an amalgamation of all of the places I've lived and all the musicians that I've that I love. Yeah, but I mean, listening to the disc, it's a it seems like it. The recording sessions sound like they must have been a lot of fun because it's very much a collaborative sound of, of the band. It's a, there's a lot of interplay between uh, the players. I mean, uh, I really love you know in, in particular with you know the drummer is doing just sort of uh, playing along like rhythmically along with some of the melodic lines. It's 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 really great. The recording sessions must have been just great, were they? Oh yeah, it's interesting actually. We recorded this album in one six hour session. <laughs> So it was, we literally walked into the studio. I mean, um, you know, time is money for, right. for musicians. So we walked into the studio, we rehearsed the day before, and these are such professional musicians that you can do that. Yeah. We rehearsed the day before we walked into the studio, we sat down and we recorded it and then we left. Um, oh, boy. And it was a lot of fun, definitely because it was my first album. I mean, that's, a, um, you know, just like a high energy. It's a lot of energy to put out in six hours. Right. Um, so it, it definitely was, um, you know, just an intense, an intense day, but so much fun and just such a joy to be around those musicians. And they're so great. Everyone's coming from the same kind of place. We've all studied the same music and just so much fun to get to interact with those musicians. Nice. Nice. Um, I got to ask the question that you recorded it in 2019 and it's sort of in the zeitgeist now. Uh, were there any holdups because of COVID getting the CD out? Did that create any problems putting like producing the, the record and getting it out there? Can you talk about that a little bit? The, there weren't actually, the release date was the exact it was March 20th, the, the album release date, and it had been planned for a few months. And, you know, the week of March 20th, 2020 was the week that the entire world kind of fell apart <laughs> right. due to COVID. Um, but we were like, what, what are we going to do? Not put it out? Wait, that doesn't make any sense. So we put it out March 20th. And it was actually very, very cool to see the reaction in the first few weeks that it was out that was the time when Italy was the COVID hotspot of the world um right. mar late March 2020 and it was very cool because several people were um from Italy like in Italy bought my album off my website and I just thought that was really really neat the kind of global support that you were starting to see for artists and musicians as we were all going through the same devastation. Yeah, right. Um, okay, so your playing on the on the record is just amazing. And it, it got me thinking, how do you can you talk us about talk us through about how you became a jazz guitar player? I mean, most, most people when you when you play guitar, it's to play in a rock band, right? What is it that drew drew you to jazz? And I, I'm sort of I hate this question because it's sort of generic, but I'm gonna ask it. Were there any jazz guitar players that you really wanted to sound like? Like, who are your, who are your influences? 
Mm -hmm. Well, I started playing guitar just, um, I didn't grow up with jazz. It wasn't even on my radar as a, as a kid. And I started playing guitar in my, um, as a teenager, just in my bedroom. I loved, you know, the, the Winnipeg, we have such a strong roots and folk music scene here. I love Joni Mitchell. I loved Bob Dylan. I love Neil Young. So I, I grew up and started playing guitar as a teenager just to sing along, be able to accompany myself playing these songs. And it sort of developed. I got more and more into guitar and just loved figuring songs out. And then I think the big, the big kind of transition was when I, I made a shift into blues and started listening to B.B. King and oh, really? Debo Walker and all of the great blues guitar players. And from there, it's really not too far to Wes Montgomery, to Grant Green, to Joe Pass, to Kenny Burrell. And yeah. I just, somebody gave me a physical copy of the Wes Montgomery album, Smoking at the Half Note. And I no. listened to it in my car for like a year. <laughs> And that was it. I just, and that's still my all time favorite record. I just love it so much. Isn't, isn't that crazy? Cause I had written down here. There's two guitar players that your sound reminds me of Wes Montgomery. Seriously, <laughs> no doubt it's there. And the other one, and this is a guitar player I grew up listening to as a teenager. Uh, he recorded a lot in uh, with Mo Kaufman and Don Thompson, a guy by the name of Ed Bickert. Yes. I, I don't yep. know if you know about him. He's, I think he's passed away now, but uh, I loved Ed Bickert's sound and your sound actually in many ways reminds me. It's so it's, it's a very clear and very sweet sound. Um, oh. So it's, yeah, it's funny that Wes Montgomery was one of the people that you, but also uh, Ed Bickert and throughout the disc, it's that sound that on, on guitar, it's very, whether or not you're accompanying the, the horn players or soloing yourself, it, it's, it has that same clear clarity that ed bickert had anyway oh thank you that's very cool <laughs> it, it's a it, it's a beautiful beautiful sound um i have to turn to uh the tunes that you wrote are there any particular tunes that is there one that you are particularly fond of and maybe can you give us a backstory behind that tune if there is one yeah i wrote um i think the composition that i'm the most proud of is the tune In a Daydream. Um, I wrote it when I still, when I was living here in Winnipeg and I just was dreaming about, you know, big things. And I didn't know if I could achieve them. You know, I wanted to move to the big city and I wanted to, you know, be a performer. I was still a student, still, you know, a, um, still kind of in my beginnings. And I wrote this tune and took it into my composition teacher, John Gordon at the University of Manitoba. And he, he just loved it. And he started bringing it to his own jam sessions in New York and saying, oh, can we play this tune written by this, the young composer, Jocelyn Gould? And I wrote lyrics to it. We did an instrumental version on the record, but I am planning to re-record it with lyrics at some point. And um, yeah, for me, it just is, I think my proudest composition, the way mm. it came out. Can I share my favorite, favorite tune on the record? Yes. Argyle. I don't know what it is. I, I can't put my finger on it, but can you give us, give, like, how did, Ar what is Argyle? How, how did that, that tune come about? Yes, Argyle, interestingly enough, is a building at um, Portage and like right where Portage and Notre Dame intersect near, right. near Portage and Maine. There's a really old warehouse building and it's called the Argyle. And uh, when I lived in Winnipeg, a bunch of us had art like art spaces in it where we would all have jam sessions and hang out all night and play and practice and write music. And I wrote it kind of just about that, that vibe of all the artists, a real, a real art hub in Winnipeg. Ah, that's great. Yeah, no, I, I love it. It's, it's really great. Uh, and speaking of, while we're on the subject of titles, can you give Classic 107 listeners a little background? What's behind the name of the CD, Elegant Traveler? I think I have a pretty good idea where it comes from, but can you fill us in on how that how you came up with the title for the disc? Yeah, absolutely. So it actually was not my title. It was 
the um, one of the record label owners that I recorded the album with, um, the label Positone, I was throwing around titles. We were kind of going back and forth with titles and nothing was really resonating all that much. And I knew this album was about, you know, all the places I had lived, all the all the people I had met in all of these different locations since I had been moving around the world so much and, and making so many places my home in that period of time. And one day he just called me and he said, he said, I have it, elegant traveler. And I was like, I was like, but I'm not, I, I can't call myself elegant. <laughs> I'm, yeah. And he was like, he was like, you're not calling yourself elegant. We are calling you elegant. <laughs> oh, wow. And I was like, oh, okay. Well, was, okay, that's great. And so it, it grew on me over time because at first I was like, Does, am I allowed to call myself elegant? <laughs> ah. I actually, I actually thought it was a tie in because uh, on the booklet for the, for the CD, you've got a quote by Maya Angelou that says surviving is important thriving is elegant so I thought maybe that's that's where the title came from but yeah uh, I love that quote that's absolutely a beautiful quote mm -hmm. it's a it's a beautiful disc uh, I'm gonna wrap the conversation up this way uh, Jocelyn can you tell us uh, how people can get a hold of you and can get a hold of the disc and all the nitty-gritty on that end mm -hmm, absolutely well as most people know the um the most effective way to support an artist is to purchase a CD directly from them. So my website, uh, jocelyngould.com, you can get a personalized CD from me. I will sign it and put it in the mail myself. And I would love to do that. Um, my social media, Instagram and Facebook, it's all Jocelyn Gould Music is the handle. And yeah, I would love to, to see you all over there. Mm -hmm. And the name, the name of the album, once again, for our listeners is Elegant Travel. And let me tell you, I'm serious. I've, been, I've listened to this CD several times and it is a beautiful, beautiful disc. Jocelyn, thanks so much for taking the time to chat with me. Congratulations on the Juno. That's a big coup. Um, mazel tov as it, as it was. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank it's, you it's so, so much. And happy birthday. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Great birthday present. Oh. Nothing like a Juno. That's for Nothing sure. like a Juno for a birthday present. That is very true. <laughs> Thanks again.